that. So we're going to get on with the program. Let me introduce Marvin Nathan. Besides being a member of the firm that I've already mentioned, Marvin has, is an alum of the University of Houston and he has been, I think, one of our most active and continuously uh, uh, supportive uh, alumni. He's currently on the uh, U of H uh, Law Foundation Board. Uh, he's served as president of the Law Alumni Association and in a whole variety of, uh, of positions with reference to the Law Foundation and the alumni. Uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, through the course of a large number, and I won't mention how many, Marvin, because of the uh, identify both yours and my age uh, uh, of, of deans over the years. Marvin has been probably the most valued uh, uh, advisor and helper uh, throughout uh, just a large number of projects. He's also a member of the board of ADL and served on several international reserves on national planning committees uh, in the organization. Uh, and truly, besides doing all of that, uh, all of that community and university service, uh, still manages to uh, have one of the most respected practices in uh, Texas and uh, national. Uh, Marvin's also a great personal friend. You know, it's my pleasure to introduce him and have him come up and be perfect. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It is really indeed a privilege for me to be with you this morning uh, and to introduce our speakers uh, who will talk about the contours of the First Amendment and free speech jurisprudence and at the same time uh, talk about the intersection of what happens in the real world uh, when people with different uh, philosophies, ideologies uh, come together uh, on college campuses, both public and private campuses. But before I do that, I thought I would take just a few minutes to talk about the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, I think many of you in the audience this morning know about the ADL, uh, but for those of you who don't, uh, bear with me for just a few minutes as I give you a very brief uh, history and profile of the agency. Uh, the very purpose of the Constitution of the United States of America, as stated in its preamble, is to create a more perfect union. Those who wrote our Constitution understood very well that people are not perfect and that our Constitution will not make us perfect. But what brings us closer to a more perfect union is striving towards the goal in the words of the Constitution of establishing justice and ensuring the blessings of liberty. The anti League, founded in 1913, is an American civil rights organization which was formed to secure justice and fair treatment to all citizens alike and to end forever unjust and unfair discrimination against any sect or body of citizens. In fulfilling the mission of ADL, its 28 offices reach out to their regional communities to build bridges of understanding and mutual respect. In accomplishing ADL's mission, these regions depend heavily on their community partners such as the University of Houston Law School. Today's program is an example of that collaboration. Additionally, 14 Houston law firms participated in ADL's 2011 Summer Associate Research Project to provide summer law students with opportunities to research and write on important, cutting-edge constitutional issues. Their research helps ADL in developing policy and programs some of the firms participating in this year's project are Andrews Kerr, Baker Botts, Beck Red and Secrets, Fulbright Jaworski, Haynes and Boone, Jones Day, Keen and Spalding, Lock Ward, Bissell and Liddell, Liskow and Lewis, our firm, Nathan Summers Jacobs, Schleiner, Silverbarg and Payne, Vincent and Elkins, Wild Gotchin and Andrews, just to name those. This is the largest number of firms to participate in this summer program since ADL started four years ago. And more than 50 summer law students participated in the program. It's exactly these types of partnerships and collaborations which enable ADL to make a difference. ADL filed its first amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court in 1948. And since then, it has continued to file amicus briefs in practically every major civil rights case presented in court. ADL lobbies for civil rights legislation, 
For example, ADL worked for passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It commissioned scholarly studies to investigate aspects of discrimination and prejudice in American life, which yielded numerous publications and resulted in a new era of interfaith and community dialogue. Interfaith and outreach conferences and programs are sponsored by ADL to wrestle with the issues that have long divided America's diverse communities. ADL launched its World of Difference program to combat prejudice, to promote democratic ideals, to strengthen pluralism, and to provide anti-bias training in the classroom, the workplace, corporate settings, and law enforcement. ADL has long campaigned against extremism and extremist groups. The lead draft of the Model Hate Crime Law, which was authored in large part by one of our presenters today, Fred Lawrence, and which has been enacted in 45 states and the District of Columbia. ADL led the coalition over a period of 11 years to support the recently enacted federal hate crimes laws. ADL promotes initiatives and distributes educational materials to counter extremism and to expose violent, prone, racist movements. And ADL is leading international and domestic efforts to combat online hate and bullying. ADL's fight against anti-Semitism, racism, bigotry, bias, and other forms of hate continue simultaneously with its work in building and strengthening relationships in all communities to achieve social justice and end hatred. ADL is a Jewish organization, but from its inception, ADL has always understood that the fate of all Americans is intertwined and that safeguarding the civil rights of all of us is imperative. For if one individual is victimized, no individual is secure. With that, I'd like to begin our program. It is indeed a personal privilege for me to introduce each of our speakers to you this morning. Uh, by way of background, let me tell you that Irwin and Fred, for the past 11 or 12 summers, uh, have collaborated and provided to ADL's national leadership a summary of the end of each Supreme Court term, explaining jurisprudence which is important to us and which is important to the community at large. Uh, those of you who have listened in on those calls uh, would, would uh, only compare it to some of your best constitutional law uh, classes, such as those that uh, are taught here at the university. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Irwin, and I'll also introduce Fred, and then they'll speak again, about these contours of the First Amendment uh, and then the intersection of how uh, First Amendment jurisprudence uh, affects uh, what goes on in the real world on public and private campuses as well as elsewhere. Erwin Chemerinsky is the founding dean and distinguished professor of law at the University of California Irvine School of Law with a joint appointment in political science. Irvine did well. Previously, Erwin taught at Duke Law School for four years, during which he won the Duke University Scholar Teacher of the Year Award in 2006. Before that, Erwin taught for 21 years at the University of Southern California School of Law and served for four years as director of the Center for Communications Law and Policy. He has also taught at UCLA School of Law and DePaul University College of Law. Erwin's areas of expertise are constitutional law, federal practice, civil rights and civil liberties, and appellate litigation. He is the author of seven books, most recently, The Conservative Assault on the Constitution, published almost a year ago, and nearly 200 articles in top law reviews. Uh, I feel a little bit like George Patton this morning, if you remember from the movie, as he was trying to prepare for a battle with Ronald, he said, I read your book. And I can only tell you that I read Irwin's book and I am prepared for this morning. <laughs> Irwin frequently argues cases before the nation's highest courts, and he also serves as a commentator on legal issues for national and local media. Irwin holds a law degree from Harvard Law School and a bachelor's degree from Northwestern University. My good friend, Fred Lawrence, Someone whom I've had the honor of working with for many years in the Anti-Defamation League and in other endeavors. 
let me tell you that Fred is no stranger to the ADL. In fact, he is a member of our family, a national commissioner, a member of its National Civil Rights Committee, and former chair of ADL's National Legal Affairs Committee from 2003 to 2006. Fred's professional background includes service as the chief of the Civil Rights Unit in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, and is a distinguished member of the faculty at the Boston University School of Law. He served as Dean and Robert Kramer Research Professor of Law at the George Washington University Law School. On January 1 of this year, 2011, Fred became the eighth president of Brandeis University and Brandeis Children's Right. Fred is the author of Punishing Hate, Bias Crimes Under American Law, the definitive book on hate crimes laws. He has been a forceful proponent of hate crimes laws before Congress and in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and an invaluable resource to ADL in this subject. Fred is nationally recognized as an expert on hate crimes, hate speech, and the First Amendment, and today he's going to share some thoughts with us on how these issues are currently playing out across America, particularly on our nation's college campuses. Please join me in welcoming as our first speaker, Dean Owen Chimbrinsky. Thank you so much for the coming introduction and the warm welcome. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to be at the University of Houston. I'm so impressed because of this program on the First Amendment, you get these hands game day to come to campus. <laughs> It's always very special for me to be with Brad. As you mentioned, we've been doing the program with the ADL for about a dozen years now. We always do it by telephone from opposite ends of the country. So getting to be together and sit next to each other and visit in person is really a treat. I admire Fred so much for his teaching, for his scholarship, and his role as an administrator. In the summer of 2007, the Los Angeles Times reported that I was the front runner to be the dean of the University of California University. I immediately began to get emails and phone calls asking if I knew that the University of California at Irvine was an anti-Semitic campus. This raised great concern. I was making the move from Duke to plan that I'll spend the rest of my career at the University of California at Irvine. My wife, who was a chaired professor at Duke, was giving that up to join the faculty at the University of California at Irvine. We were going to buy a house, a large neighborhood of faculty housing, right on campus, and with my younger children to live at the University of California, Irvine. And certainly would hardly want to be an anti Semitic place or an environment that would be hostile to anybody, especially the Jews. So I did a lot of checking into this, and I learned that what it was about was every year in the late spring and May, the Muslim Student Union on campus would have a week of speakers and demonstrations. They would often bring onto campus individuals who would say anti-Israeli things, and the speakers would say anti-Jewish things. And some believe that because the campus allowed these speakers to be present, that made the campus and its administration anti-Semitic. Of course, the campus had no alternative but to allow the Muslim Student Union bring their speakers. Any attempt by the campus to exclude them would violate the First Amendment. The campus officials knew this. The campus officials responded, in each instance, completely appropriately. On a number of occasions, the campus speakers had decried the hateful things that were said, but also said that the First Amendment took the right to utter it. <coughs> what I was most surprised about was the lack of understanding about the First Amendment. This is a public university. The speech occurred in public places. And yet over and again, I have people say that tolerating such speech was inconsistent with basic norms of decency and it should be allowed. I thought what I would do this morning to set up the discussion is summarize six principles about free speech. I'll particularly focus on campuses, though all of these transcend the college and university environment. The First Amendment, of course, is that the First Amendment applies only to the government. 
in the realm of universities applies only to public college universities. Private entities don't have to comply with the Constitution. So if you put it in the context of universities, the University of California, Irvine, has to follow the First Amendment. Brandeis University doesn't. So when I was teaching at Duke, if the president there would fire me for criticizing him, or I guess I should say criticizing him again, <laughs> I couldn't sue him. But if my chancellor ever would, not that he would, fire me because of my speech, I could sue. I would sue. I win. My favorite example of this is a true story of a conversation I had with my oldest two sons 19 years ago, when they were nine and six, and we were in a grocery store. The grocery store was giving away, the, 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 the selling Diet Coke, and Diet Coke was giving away three baseball cards. And on the outside of the package of Diet Coke, there were three baseball cards pictured. And as we went up and down the aisles of the grocery store, my two sons were arguing, which they often did, but who was going to get the extra baseball card? <laughs> Finally, I said, be quiet. I don't want to hear anything else about baseball cards that leave the grocery store. My then nine-year-old turned to me and said, you can't tell me to be quiet. I've got freedom of speech. <laughs> I was ready for him. I said, freedom of speech means that the government can't tell you to be quiet. I'm not the government, so I can. To which he looked at me and said, well, you'd like the government to me, so you should be able to tell you. <laughs> it's a true story. It's when I first knew that someday he was going to <laughs> the second principle that I identify is that generally content-based restrictions on speech are not allowed unless they're necessary to achieve a compelling government interest. If there's any principle that's for a current First Amendment law, is that there's a strong presumption against the government regulating speech based on the content of the message. The idea is that it shouldn't be for the government to pick and choose what messages can be uttered or heard based on the viewpoint, or even based on their subject matter. Let me give you a recent example of this, a Supreme Court case from June 27th of this year, and then elaborate the principle. The case is Brown versus Entertainment Merchants. It involves a California law that made it a crime to sell or rent violent video games to minors under 18 without parental consent. The Supreme Court, in a 7-2 decision, declared this unconstitutional. Justice Scalia wrote the opinion for the court. He said, this is a content-based restriction on speech. He said, video games are a form of speech under the First Amendment. So this law applies only to those that have a certain content. The law speaks of violence to humans with human-like images. I would imagine that would even include Super Mario Brothers, because a lot of bad things happen to Mario and Luigi as they jump from mushroom to mushroom. But the Supreme Court's point was, this is a content-based restriction on speech. The government has such a law only if it can prove it that it serves a compelling interest and the law is really necessary for it. And Justice Scalia writing for the court said, there's no proof that playing violent video games causes violent behavior. So there's no reason to believe that violent video games are more likely to cause violent behavior than reading violent novels. He gave the example of Dante's Inferno. I guess a lot more teenagers play violent video games than read Dante's Inferno. <laughs> But he also gave us examples of violent comic books and violent movies. The Supreme Court over the years has made it clear that a law is content-based, it's defined by the subject matter of the speech it's restricting, or the viewpoint of the speech that it's restricting. So, for example, with regard to subject matter, Chicago had an ordinance that said there could not be picketing in residential neighborhoods unless it was a labor protest for labor placement. The Supreme Court says, that means the speech is allowed if it's about labor. It's not allowed on any other topic. And the Supreme Court said, that's a content-based restriction. The court declared it unconstitutional. Some public schools have tried to say that they'll allow student groups to use facilities, lunch and after school, but not religious student groups. 
So they've allowed the debate team or the chess club, but not the Bible club. And the Supreme Court has declared that unconstitutional. The Supreme Court said that's a content-based restriction on speech. If the school's going to open its facilities to student groups, evenings and weekends to community groups, it can't discriminate based on the subject matter of the speech. Even more clearly, the government can't restrict speech based on its viewpoint. Imagine if the government were to say that they'll allow pro-war demonstrations in the city park, but not anti-war demonstrations. Hard to imagine much more inimical than the First Amendment. The government picking and choosing the views that it wants to be expressed. There was one case where Washington, D.C. had an ordinance that said there could not be demonstrations that a couple hundred feet of a foreign embassy that were likely to be embarrassing to the foreign government. So the speech was allowed if it was praising of a foreign government, but not if it was critical of a foreign government. That's clearly a viewpoint restriction that's impermissible. The third principle that I'd identify is that the government cannot punish speech or hold it liable just because it's offensive, even deeply offensive. Again, I can pick an example from just this year in a case decided by the Supreme Court. It's a decision that got a lot of media attention. Snyder versus Phelps. It involves a small church out of Topeka, Kansas, the Westboro Baptist Church. It's led by Fred and Margie Phelps. They have the practice of going to funerals of those who died in military service. And using those funerals the occasion for expressing strong, vile, anti-gay, anti-lesbian messages. Matthew Snyder was a Marine who died in military service in Iraq. Fred and Margie Phelps, members of the Westboro Baptist Church, went to his funeral in Maryland. They asked the local police officer where they lawfully could be. And the officer pointed public sidewalks about a thousand feet away from the funeral. Before the funeral began, they chanted and sang. During the funeral, there was silence and not disruptive. But they held up signs, and the signs did convey vile, anti-gay, anti-lesbian messages. Albert Snyder, Matthew's father, could not read the signs at the time of the funeral. He could see just the tops of the signs to know that they were there. That night on the news, he watched footage and could read the signs. He was deeply offended. He sued the Phelps and the members of the Westboro Baptist Church for intentional infliction of emotional distress, intrusion on the seclusion, and conspiracy. A jury in federal court ruled in favor of Snyder. The district court judge allowed a $10 million damage judgment to stand, including compensatory and punitive damages. The Fourth Circuit reversed on First Amendment grounds. The Supreme Court affirmed that 8 to 1, ruling in favor of the Phelps against Snyder. Chief Justice Roberts wrote to the court, only Justice Alito dissented. Chief Justice Roberts said, this was speech on a matter of public concern. We were engaged in a national debate with regard to rights for gays and lesbians. He said, this speech, that at all times was lawfully on a public sidewalk, and at no time was disrupted. He said, we can't claim a right to privacy when we're outside our home. We can't claim to be a captive audience around the public. I think these are heart-wrenching facts, but as a matter of First Amendment law, I think it was an easy case, which lies at 8 to 1. Because there's no principle or basic to the First Amendment that the government can't punish speech or hold it liable just because it's offensive, even deeply offensive. The Supreme Court has said there's a right to burn an American flag to form political protest, though many are deeply offended by that. The Supreme Court has said there's a right to burn a cross, even though it's given its vile history, causing enormous emotional distress. Every court to rule said that the Nazis had the right to march through Skokie, Illinois, but it caused great emotional distress to the Holocaust survivors that were there. The Supreme Court followed this principle in Snyder versus Phelps. The fourth principle 
is that there are narrow categories of speech that are unprotected by the First Amendment. So if this category of speech that's unprotected by the First Amendment, then the government can punish or hold liable for such expression. Example, incitement of illegal activity is unprotected by the First Amendment. Early in the 20th century, the Supreme Court said that if speech poses a clear and present danger causing harm, that it's likely to incite illegal activity, that is not protected by the First Amendment. Justice Oliver, one of the Holmes, wrote this opinion, and so he said there's no right to falsely shot fire in a crowded theater. By the late 20th century, the Supreme Court had refined this test to make it very difficult to find that speech is incitement unprotected by the First Amendment. In Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969, the Supreme Court said, it's speech that can be punished as incitement only if there's a substantial likelihood of imminent illegal activity and only if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegal activity. Another category of speech that's unprotected that relates to much of what we're talking about today is true threats are not protected by the First Amendment. There is no First Amendment right to threaten another, to cause another to fear for his or her safety. When Snyder versus Phelps was decided, I read some legal commentary saying, no longer would it be possible to sue for intentional infliction of emotional distress. That's wrong. Of course there could be suits for intentional infliction of emotional distress outside the speech context. There even could be suits for intentional infliction of emotional distress when it's speech not protected by the First Amendment. Imagine that one person directly threatens another. Imagine it's a threat that's based on race, religion, or anything else. If it is, in the words of the Supreme Court, a true threat, there could be liability for intentional infliction of emotional distress. Snyder vs. just says, with speech protected by the First Amendment, there can't be such liability. The Supreme Court has spent a lot of the last century trying to define these categories like incitement and obscenity and others that are unprotected speech. But there are exceptions to the usual rule that content-based restrictions on speech are allowed only if they're necessary to achieve a compelling government interest. A fifth principle of the First Amendment is that any regulation of speech by the government must be narrowly drawn. It can't be vague and it can't be overbroad. The Supreme Court has long said that vague laws violate due process because people have the right to know what's legal and illegal before they act. But the Supreme Court is particularly concerned about vague laws or overbroad laws that regulate speech. The Court is worried that they'll chill constitutionally protected expression. This has come up often in the context we're talking about today, civility, and particularly college campuses. Beginning about 20 years ago, over 200 colleges and universities across the country adopted so-called hate speech codes. All of these were well-intentioned, but most of these, as drafted for public college universities, violated the First Amendment. They were, as written, vague and quite overbroad. Every court that I know of that's ruled on one of these so-called hate speech codes but an unconstitutional, and almost all of them have found to violate the First Amendment and they missed over those grounds. One of the more famous cases involved the University of Michigan's hate speech code. Among other things, it prohibited, punished students for speech that would stigmatize others on the basis of race or gender. A graduate student in sociobiology was the named plaintiff in the lawsuit. So a lot of my research is about whether or not there's biological differences between men and women. So I'm afraid that if I publish such research, some might say that I'm stigmatizing <laughs> on the basis of gender. Some said that perhaps advocacy of affirmative action might be perceived by opponents of affirmative action as speech stigmatizing on the basis of race. 
And the district court in Michigan, like courts across the country, declared the laws unconstitutional on vagueness and overbreadth grounds. So if there's going to be any law that regulates speech, it has to be narrowly drawn. Sixth and finally, there is a right to use at least some government property for speech purposes. But even as to that property, the government can regulate through reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions that serve an important government purpose and leave open adequate alternate places for communication. There's an enormous amount of litigation over what government property is available for speech under what circumstances. And the Supreme Court has categorized it. The Supreme Court has said, well, there are the public forums where the government is constitutionally required to make the place available for speech. And the court's given sidewalks and parks to see those things. But then there's the places that the government could close, that the government chooses to open to speech. What's even attached to labels saying, well, those are designated public forums. And then there's the places that the government could close, but it opens just some speakers to some messages. So those will be limited public forums. And then there's places that the government basically can close to all speech, non-public forums. And there's a lot of litigation over the type of government property fits into which of these categories. But even as to the places that are public forums, sidewalks, parks, open space on campus and public universities, the government can regulate so long as it's a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. So it's an important government purpose and leaves open adequate alternate places for communication. I received a lot of calls from reporters in the last month or two about whether or not cities have to leave open parks for the Occupy Wall Street or Occupy LA or Occupy Orange County movement. And my answer always is, the law is clear here. There has to be a place, a park, where demonstrators can go. But there can be time, place, and manner restrictions. The Supreme Court said, for example, in a case called Clark for Street and Nonviolence, that the government, for aesthetic reasons, can keep people from sleeping in a park as a form of protest. So the government doesn't have to allow Occupy Wall Street or Occupy LA to permanently occupy 24 hours a day at home. We can argue whether it's good or bad, but I think the law is pretty clear if they want to say, you have a right to be in this part of the park from dawn to dusk, but you can't sleep there. Clark for Street and Nonviolence is exactly on point to that. On college campuses, this is certainly true. The open areas of a public university are a public forum, and the government can regulate only to the needs that I just articulated. On the other hand, a classroom like this in a public university, well, an event like this is going on, classes in session, it's not a public forum. This came up on my campus almost two years ago, great national publicity. In February of 2010, Israeli Ambassador Michael Oren was invited to speak on campus and invited to speak in an auditorium much like this. As he began to speak, a student from the Muslim Student Union stood up, shouted vile things, and was escorted away. The students were admonished not to disrupt the speaker, and that if they did, they'd be escorted away and arrested and there would be a question and answer period at the end where the students could say what they wanted. Ambassador Warren began again. Another student stood up, yelled so he could not be heard. That student was escorted away. A third student did the same thing. Ambassador Warren left the stage. The chancellor, the person who was presiding over the event, the chair of the science Park, Mark Petronka, begged the audience not to interrupt Ambassador Warren. Ambassador Warren was persuaded to come back to the podium and Another student stood up, yelled so he could not be heard. That student was escorted away. Eleven students did this in all. Each of them was escorted away and arrested. And finally, the supporters of the Muslim Student Union, the members of that group, stood up, chanted, and left. And Jasper Warren completed his speech. This, as you can imagine, got a great deal of attention on campus, community, even nationally. And yet I think as a matter of law, it's an 
easy question. The students who interrupted the speaker did not have a First Amendment right to do so. It was not a public forum where he was speaking. It was an event in a classroom. There's not the right to silence the speaker by shouting the speaker down. There's no protection of the First Amendment for being a hacker. The university punished these students. The specific punishment is not publicly disclosable because of the Federal Education Records Privacy Act. It's been widely reported that the students receive a suspension in order to do community service. The district attorney of Orange County, Antonio Caucus, then decided to criminally prosecute these students. It's a misdemeanor under California law to disrupt a public meeting, and it's a misdemeanor to engage in civil conspiracy to do so. I thought that the criminal prosecution was completely unnecessary. The students have been punished by the university. That seemed to be sufficient. Speech often occurs on campus, and generally, there's a criminal prosecution, unless it endangers or damages property or persons. That can go on here. And so, throughout the process, I've been consistent saying, I don't think the student's speech was protected by the First Amendment. I think the university was justified in punishing the students. I don't think a criminal prosecution was necessary. You might know that a couple months ago, the jury convicted these students. Um, I immediately wrote an op-ed piece that said to you what I said today. This wasn't speech protected by the First Amendment, the criminal prosecution was unnecessary. As soon as my op-ed piece went online, I got a call. It was one of the students who was convicted. He said, you're wrong. What I was doing was speech protected by the First Amendment. I'm talking a while, but I wasn't going to persuade him otherwise. I hung up the phone. The next call I got was from a Chabad rabbi in Orange County. He said, these students deserve to be in prison for what they did. And then said to my sister, I don't want to take any more calls. Like this. <laughs> but I think that the principles that are articulated and that I've applied here lead to a clear result, at least with regard to the First Amendment. I think maybe the wisest thing that was ever said about the First Amendment was that we don't need the First Amendment for the speech that we like. We'll allow that to go on anyway. We'll allow the speech that we like to happen on college campuses when society. What we really need the First Amendment for is the speech we detest. <laughs>
we obviously operate, I'll say, in the shadow of the First Amendment, but in a way, in a very important way, we operate in the world of free expression in a, what I'll call a, a relentlessly normative world. There is no First Amendment that binds us, per se, I will cabin for now the issue that actually Commonwealth of Massachusetts, our state version of the First Amendment, actually does apply to private actors in certain settings. So what I said actually is, a, is an overstatement for certain purposes. But for our purposes, uh, let, let's treat us as a private university in any of the other 49 states. So we are in a relentlessly normative environment, by which I mean we get to say what would we want our free expression jurisprudence to be, because we are not bound by case law, per se, and not bound by the First Amendment, per se. This was really driven home to me very early on in my presidency, in fact, so early that I wasn't even president then. It was during the period of the transition when I was president-elect. I met with the leadership of the, the faculty senate, who were in the process of proposing revisions to the harassment rules and the, I won't call them speech code rules, but obviously if you're talking about what the rules are with respect to harassment, both in and outside of classrooms, that begins to bump into speech pretty, pretty early on. Uh, they thought, and I think probably uh, it's good for all purposes, that this issue having presented itself when it did, it was just as well to push it over past January 1st when the new president was going to be coming in. But of course, they read just about enough of my work to be dangerous. Um, and whether it's your colleagues or your children, there's nothing quite worse than hearing your own words parroted back to you. Uh, and I said to them, um, particularly in response to one person who said, I think we should write into our rules that even though we're a private university, we agree to be bound by the First Amendment, straight up. And I think given a lot of what I've written in the area, uh, in related areas, he assumed that I would be broadly embracing that notion. And I said instead, was be careful what you wish for. You, in fact, may not want to be bound for all purposes in this community by the First Amendment. My guess is that's got a little shock value in this room. That was the reason for saying it. So I'll come back a little bit later on to some examples as to why I think simply, uh, and I will say brittly, saying we will be bound by the First Amendment and a private university would not give us the result that we would want at Brandeis. So how do we begin to think about what ought free expression to, to look like in a private university? Uh, Irwin's first principle is the First Amendment applies to the public institutions, not private institutions. That means we could do content restrictions if we wanted to, if we chose to. Uh, we could restrict or even eliminate deeply offensive speech. That's what we chose to do. We, we are not a public forum. We are a private forum. We can't exclude people altogether if that's what we choose to do. Now, the fact that you can doesn't mean that you should. Uh, and obviously, there is a substantial overlap between what we, in fact, do and First Amendment jurisprudence, which shouldn't be surprising. 200 years of First Amendment jurisprudence has thought through a lot of these issues and gotten you to a place that a normative environment starting from the ground up would want you to get to in any event. Uh, but it does give us a chance to go back to, to first principles and what we would think about these things. Were there no First Amendment? Now, one I'll start with, which may sound like an odd place to start. It's got something to do with where my own academic interests came, but I think it gives us a remarkable clarity of vision in some of these issues. Is actually the way in which criminal law theory looks at many of these questions. You know, the, the question that, that Irwin was talking about in terms of what kind of speech would or would not cross the line in terms of intimidation or harassment in a criminal or civil libel sense as opposed to a protected sense, many um, lawyers, non lawyers alike, law students, when they bump into that issue for the first time, will ask the question, well, how do you know? How do you know what somebody was? trying to do or intending to do. And of course, that's a question we run into in the criminal law all the time. Mens rea issues, state of mind issues of the, of the you know, bread and butter of a criminal defense lawyer, say nothing of a prosecutor. And the need to prove, the need to figure out what is in somebody's mind is critical to what we do all the time. So in fact, the criminal law maps onto what becomes First Amendment jurisprudence in a very helpful way, I think, in the sense that we can ask questions about what the speaker's or the actor's intent was. Is it an intent to threaten and intimidate? Is it an intent to, to communicate? Sometimes those lines are hard to draw. Sometimes I would say they are surprisingly easy to draw. This took me about 50,000 words in an article to work out, but I have to tell you it was better captured in a single panel a cartoon that appeared in a newspaper some years ago of a group of, uh, of, of fellows in, in sheets and hoods 
circling around a burning cross, and the caption is one is saying to the other, you know, I sure hope this is a hate crime. I'd hate to think we were wasting our time exercising our First Amendment rights. <laughs> so, to a certain extent, the, the, uh, the lines are not always that hard to draw. And it's interesting that the Supreme Court in Virginia Against Black really mapped on, in First Amendment terms, what the ADL brief, and I'm proud I had some small role in, uh, took in a both First Amendment and, and criminal role sense, which is to say, look at the two cases that came up in Virginia against Black and ask what the actor was about. What was going on here? You have two cross burnings. One was a case where the proof was overwhelming that it was designed to intimidate an African American uh, and to do so on racial grounds based on the antipathy that had occurred between the actor and the victim in that case. And the weapon that was chosen, I'll say, to terrorize, to threaten these people was the burning cross, which was designed to, and in fact did, pick up all of the significance and the meaning and the history of that symbol and the intent of the actor and the result, predictably, reasonably foreseeable, was intimidation and threatening of the victim. On the other hand, the other case that came up in Virginia against Black was the more standard clan rally. I, I don't happen to, to share the, the views of white supremacists Right, uh, supremacism and anti-Semitism and homophobia that the Klan was purveying in their rally, but it was clearly a rally where they were articulating their views and expressing their views, and so the court said that one would, would uh, be protected and actually read the Virginia statute in such a way that it would not cover that on even as being constitutional. I think you get to the same place, actually, by asking the men's, men's rate of question in those cases uh, as to what the actors were intending and where we ought to go and ought not to go. And that helps frame some of what we think about in terms of what we should and should not restrict on a private university campus. Now, we have other values as well that are more at home on a university campus besides coming at it from a criminal law perspective. Obviously, one of the hallmark values uh, at a public and private university is that of academic freedom. Academic freedom meaning that we do, in fact, have a purpose you know, one of the risks of being a president is you can fall into the habit of thinking universities exist for the purpose of being administered. Uh, they do not. They have a mission, and it is a mission about the creation and discovery of knowledge and the dissemination of that knowledge through our teaching and through our scholarship, and that is a sacred mission. And it is one of the great honors of our lives, those of us involved in these institutions, that we get to be part of that mission. But that mission, too, gives you a great clarity of vision, I think, on how one takes on these issues. So although we do not have any public fora per se on campus, there are different places on campus where we would expect to and do have different rules in terms of how broad a protection of expression there, there may be. And here it is sort of a paradox. Erwin says that classroom is, is not a public forum and that there are rules of engagement in the classroom where speech can be excluded. This is true. Um, but the other side of that coin, and we feel this deeply in a private university without the First Amendment, is that that is where you expect the broadest protection of speech. What the faculty member chooses to say in his or her class, what the faculty member chooses to write about is the area of the broadest possible protection, and I don't need a First Amendment to do that. That's the hallmark of the value of academic freedom. Our, our institution is unrecognizable to us, except for the core value of academic freedom that gives broad swath of ability for discussion in the classroom, up to and including places where students will be made to feel somewhat uncomfortable. Threatened? No. Silenced? No. Uncomfortable? Yes. Hell, I thought the purpose of four years of college was to be made uncomfortable from time to time, <laughs> and to have your opinions challenged, and to have your views challenged, and maybe even change your mind once in a while. And the best compliment that any teacher ever gets is a student saying, you know, I started this class thinking X, and now by the end of this class, I'm really thinking X prime. Because I was forced to think about this. Or even better, you know, I find myself liking a certain author I didn't think I was supposed to like. I say, well, that's what happens when you read. <laughs> All sorts of things happen in terms of your opinions. And the need for the room to be the classroom, the lecture hall, to be a almost literally sacrosanct place where expression is protected in the broadest possible way. That's our version of a vagueness or overbreath doctrine, that a vague or overly broad regulation in the context of harassment, for example, can invade the confines of the classroom, all with good intentions. No bad people in any of those discussions. It's all people trying to work out the best kind of safe learning environment. 
The same learning environment could very well come at the cost of the discomfort, which is actually a part of the learning process that I think is, from a normative point of view, something we have to take very seriously. And then even more broadly than the classroom, we have a commitment to a kind of campus community. Who are we? What are we about? And what do we think it means to say, this is Brandesian and Brandeis? You know, they ask, what does the president of the university actually do that nobody else gets to do? I mean, the trick is just among us here. Right? What do presidents really do? Because the place essentially runs itself, you understand. Um, we forward emails, that's what we do. <laughs> the trick is knowing the right person to forward the email to. Um, seriously, the president is the person who uniquely gets to say, we stand for this. This is what this institution is about. And to articulate that, that vision, you don't do it all by yourself, obviously. You're taking soundings all the time to see what pings back and how it pings back. But there is such a thing as a, as a community. And, and here is significantly, subtly, but significantly different from standard First Amendment jurisprudence. I remember giving a talk some years ago in the UK. I was a visiting scholar at University College London. And I just written a piece on, on limits of hate, uh, when hate speech uh, that's protected becomes hate crimes that are prosecuted, was the, was the sort of topic of this paper, We're trying to work out some of this in the aftermath of RAV against St. Paul and Wisconsin against Mitchell, and some of you will recall from your early 1990s. Um, a uh, member of the faculty at University College London said to me, uh, well, suppose the following happened. Suppose that a group of skinheads uh, got a truck and they drove it into Brixton, largely a um, uh, black neighborhood, uh, with racist slogans painted on it. Uh, would you be comfortable prohibiting that? Now, we're move, remember now, we're moving back to a public forum type situation, although the UK doesn't have the First Amendment per se, it's free expression issues uh, in their uh, unwritten constitution to a large extent. With some right now from the European Convention as opposed to the American perspective. So, my response was well, I'd have to know more about what those truck drivers were doing. I want to know a little more. And he stops me and he says, Why is this so hard for you? He said, We all know why they're doing it. We all know the future. And I said, Ah, that's why it's so hard for me. Because the American system is based on the idea that we don't all know that. And you seem to be comfortable saying what we all know. But in the public square, we don't all know anything. That's what the First Amendment, in part, is measured on. That sentence actually scanned right there. If you, if you, you've got to take it apart here. It, it could easily say that the President Brandeis said nobody knows anything, but that's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I scanned it pretty carefully there. You got it there, yeah. That, yeah, believe me, you know, we're one upload away from chaos at any moment. <laughs> I'll actually come back to that in a second, too. Um, my version of the uh, Michael Warren. So, but what's different in a private university is I can use the we term. I do get to say, we at Brandeis stand for this. So when I talk about what the campus community is, there's a broadening nature to it in terms of free expression, and there's a narrowing aspect to it. First, the broadening version of it. Uh, it will not surprise anyone in this room to you know um, that I do get phone calls uh, about things like demonstrations, uh, and I get them often where Israel is concerned. And they often, in fact, it's Propitious to be having this discussion today. This is the end of uh, Palestinian Awareness Week, not just at Brandeis, but a lot of schools around the Boston area and around the country. And I will have already this week gotten calls to say, How can you at Brandeis let, and then you fill in the blank, right? How can you let Noam Chomsky speak on your campus? How can you let somebody advocate this view? How can you let somebody advocate that view? And I will tell you that usually I give a two tier response. The first one you've largely just heard from the First Amendment, although I saw it since I can't literally wrap myself in the First Amendment. And I say, we are not an advocacy institute, we are a university. And we have, as I just described, a sacred mission to, to push ideas and to explore ideas, and that will make some people uncomfortable, and that's okay. No one can be threatened, no one can be put in a position of fear, no one can be silenced. But at the same time, there will be lots of ideas that will be uh, expanded and uh, exposed and expressed, and some of them I don't agree with, and some of you won't agree with, and that's the nature of a university. And as that's still settling in, I then say, and I also have to tell you, as a, as a devoted Zionist, that I happen to believe that in an open discussion of these issues, Israel's going to come off just fine. And I think it would not be much of a statement of the pro-Israel position if you felt that the only way Israel could do well in those discussions is to take certain positions off the table. Or as an Israeli friend of mine likes to say, we're not quite as brittle or breakable as you Americans seem to think we are. Put somewhat differently, what is and is not pro-Israel, I don't think I've got a bright line on that, but I'll tell you one place I start. Anything that is said on the floor of the Knesset on a daily basis cannot qualify as anti-Israel. 
and there is probably more criticism of the state of Israel per square kilometer within the confines of the state of Israel than any place else on this globe. So we are not an advocacy institute. We are a place where ideas are explored, but within the confines of civility and within the confines of the discussion where people cannot be threatened and cannot be silenced. But now I want to say a little more than that. Because civility for us actually does allow us to go beyond what the First Amendment does, or in my view, should permit. We can exclude views from campus, and we do. When the Westboro Baptist Church came to, to Brandeis last year, we can exclude them from campus. It's private property. You cannot trespass on campus. You can't come on unless we permit it. And we stopped them at the gates of the university. We let them have their pathetic little demonstration outside of the university. And the best response to Westboro Baptist Church, in my mind, is what my wonderful Brandeis kids did. No, I do not pretend to be objective about my school. Um, my Brandeis kids uh, had something called Celebrate Brandeis up on the Great Lawn. And in response to a couple of dozen, if that, Westboro Baptist Church demonstrators, there were hundreds and hundreds of Brandeisians at 8 o'clock in the morning, and no, we did not provide food. <laughs> or even coffee. Uh, demonstrating what they called Celebrate Brandeis, which was a demonstration of the diversity of the school. Uh, and in, in, in a sense, as I said, that when I gave my remarks, uh, as someone who's written a lot about punishing hate, I think you all know at the end of the day, punishment of hate is not how bigotry is going to end. Bigotry will end not with punishment of hate, but with the practice of love. And if we can do that on campus, then we're doing something very special. And we can talk about that, and we can say that those who would purvey a message of hate are not welcome on the Brandeis campus. I would not want to live in a country where the government could do that. But a private university can do that, and we do do that. And so the example that I gave to the faculty colleague who I mentioned earlier, who said, let's full bore put the First Amendment into our harassment code and into our uh, faculty and uh, community codes that we have at Brandeis. I said, you know, my own view of the First Amendment is assuming that the following was not being done to threaten any individual or terrorize any focused victim and assuming you had a permit to burn objects in public, I'm thinking that burning a stack of Korans in public is protected by the First Amendment. But I assure you, if somebody wants to burn a stack of Korans on the Great Lawn of Brandeis University, I will prohibit it. And I'll take the heat for that if anybody wants to object to it. And my guess is most of you want me to do that. Now, I'm not sure I'd want to live in a country where the government could do that, but a private university can. And so the difference between the, the is and the ought, and the openness that the First Amendment requires, and the definition of a community that a private university permits, gives us a very different kind of take on some of these questions. So what's the goal here? What are we trying to, to reach when we think about what the community ought to look like? Let me, let me end with, with my version of the Michael Horan story. Uh, we have a program each year where six members of the Knesset uh, are invited to, uh, to Boston and to spend a couple of days on campus and also do other things in the, in the Boston area. Um, it is designed, among other things, actually to inform them about issues in the United States and in the American Jewish community. And I will just tell you as an aside, um, it was both enthralling and just ever so slightly shocking um, what they knew and did not know about the American Jewish community. If I can divert from the First Amendment issues to the Israel-American Jewish community issues, just for about 30 seconds when I asked a couple of these Knesset members uh, you don't bother asking that you have a good experience on campus. What do they tell the president of the university to know? Um, but I did say, so what did you learn? What did you learn that you didn't know? And to a person, this is two members from Likud, two members from Kadima, and two members from Labor, which they cover the political spectrum. What did you learn that you didn't know? They said, really, we're surprised to know how concerned the American Jewish community seems to be about this conversion issue. And I said, if you were surprised by that, then there is uh, what we might call a lack of communication here. Uh, so it's a good thing we brought them to, to campus for a number of those, of those issues. But the story I want to tell you is the public forum that they did, um, the open community meeting that they did. Uh, one of the uh, speakers was Avi Dichter, who some of you may know, a um, very influential member of Likud, who was the former uh, head of Mossad. And when Avi started to speak, a group of about uh, six students, about 300 in the room, a group of about six students um, stood up, uh, made some noise, um, and then turned around and, and walked out. The entire incident took less than 60 seconds. Of course, it takes less than 60 seconds to get it on an iPhone uh, and to upload it. And so uh, by the next morning, it was, in fact, around the world. Because, of course, when something like that happens at Brandeis, it is absolutely catnip to the press. 
Um, I, I got to read Maharis the next morning with the big uh, banner headline, uh, Dictor protested at Brandeis University. So it's all right. That's why I've got a telephone, so the president's going to get called. But when I saw Dictor that night, or the next night, uh, at dinner, I said, I suppose I should apologize on behalf of the university. He stops me in the middle. He says, believe me, it was not the toughest thing I've been through. Um, he said, besides, 300 kids, this must have been half a dozen. Three minute, two hour program, this must have been a minute. And I said, you should have told that to your friends from the arts. He said, I did. When he was interviewed by them, he actually went on in some length about that. Of course, that did not make it into the story. That's a different issue. We believe in the First Amendment, not because of the press, but in spite of the press. <laughs> but the, the interesting piece of the story to me does not end there. Because yes, I got plenty of phone calls. What am I going to do with those kids? What are we going to do with those kids? And my instinct, not, as I say, because of a First Amendment, but because of the nature of the community and free expression on campus, as I understand it, is the last thing I wanted to do was to come down on these kids and punish them. First of all, it would give them the only victory they really could have gotten at that event. But also would have sent completely the, the wrong message. And it would have been kind of overkill. It would have behaved rudely and inappropriately. Um, but given how short a duration it was, uh, I was not going to weigh in on that role. That's not the punchline. The punchline is several days later, it was an editorial in the student paper. Not only in the student paper, it was not the mainstream paper. It was sort of the edgy paper. Um, the independent paper, as they like to remind. Um, it was a fascinating editorial criticizing the students for disrupting the program, however briefly, saying that's not how we began to brand this. We are trained here to ask hard questions, not to be disrupted, not to be rude to guests on campus. So I now had my answer to anybody who wanted to know how I was responding to this situation. I said, that's your win. That's your gold medal. If a feeling of civility is able to spread on campus, and let's be very clear here, I'm not pretending that this problem is solved forever and will stay solved. This is an ongoing issue of a civil dialogue in a complex society. Why should our university be any different from the rest of the country in that regard? But the fact that that's how the students saw it tells me that the real answer without a First Amendment to regulations of speech comes from a place of, of civility, comes from a place of willingness to engage and to confront each other and to confound each other over the sense of not punishing hate, but of practicing love. Different. The lack of civility isn't new in American history. 
There have been other times when we've been deeply divided as a society. I know that during the Vietnam protests in the 1960s, some decried how divided we were as a society from a lack of civility. Certainly in the 1950s and the 1960s in the Civil Rights Movement, we were deeply divided as a society. Because people came passionately on both sides because we desegregated the South as a nation. You can go back through American history, and there have been plenty of times when there's been lack of civility and we've divided as a society. So, no, I don't think that this is something unique in American history. I'd say it's cyclical, though not predictable. I think there'll be periods of greater national unity and periods of greater divisiveness. We're just in a time of greater divisiveness now. And I think, again, there's more opportunities to express things with lack of civility than ever before. So then I get to your former question. Do I think that the First Amendment presumes civility or acceptance of Not at all. That I think what the First Amendment says is it's not for the government to impose civility on people by law and by regulation. I think it's fine for private universities to say that certain things are outside the bounds of civility they won't tolerate them on campus. I can't criticize in any way what Brandeis did in that regard in terms of it's making its choice. Um, and I think even in public colleges and universities, it's completely appropriate for campus officials to speak out against lack of civility even though they can't punish it. There's an incident when I was at USC Law School where something quite homophobic and deeply offensive was written on a board. And the dean immediately put a letter in every student's mailbox criticizing that, saying it was inappropriate. On my campus, when some very offensive things were said by speakers from the Muslim Student Union, the chancellor spoke out against it and said, that's not how I think we should be talking on our campus. And I think it's an appropriate thing for officials to do. But it's very different than enforcing the civility by law or enforcing the civility by punishment. So no, I don't think that the First Amendment assumes civil discourse. And I think what the First Amendment says is, it's not for the government by law or regulation to impose civility. And my hope is, we will always aspire to be civil in the way we talk to one another. I, I think I agree with that. The, uh, I think we romanticize the past when you know, everyone got along well. You read anything about the election of 1800, my God, what these people were calling each other. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to believe you know, the expression that things are what they used to be and they never were. Uh, and, uh, I, I think the one way that things are somewhat different, and I think we're just too close to it to know whether this is really true or whether with time it'll, it, it will seem less of a change. But I think it's much easier in a broad way for people to in quotation marks, communicate with, it, with each other without having any interaction, real interaction with each other. And I'll give you an interesting example of this. Um, columnist uh, David Brooks in the New York Times tells the, the story of, you know, he used to read at first all of the email that he got, and then he just said it was just too painful, he just couldn't do it. Because uh, some of the things that people were writing in emails to him were just you know, incredibly personal and offensive. But the interesting thing he described is that occasionally he would write back to one of these, and then the response that would come back was an entirely different tone of voice. So the person that they were calling all sorts of horrible things was sort of a construct. It wasn't a human being. It was you know, David Brooks' admiss in the New York Times. And then when they actually got something back from a human being named David Brooks, then they actually engaged as human beings. So I do worry to a certain extent, because we spend a lot of time on screens and not actually you know, person to person, that actually, it's easier for that sort of thing to break down. Yeah, I've actually had that experience uh, that, that they are hard. I, don't, I mean, I was mentioned to people in practice, I did not bad this week after the Supreme Court took the health care. And I was stunned by getting dozens of hate messages, really nasty ones. And I simply don't need them. And I don't respond. The only temptation I have is to someone when I write say, what would your mother think if you were saying that? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I've adopted as a practice is I never read anything in the press that's said about me or my law school, positive or negative. If it's something I need to respond to, I figure I've got an assistant dean at the end you need to respond. But I just assume not. No, it's just, uh, it's just self-defense. No, that's great. Right. So Even the positive stuff, you know, uh, it's been attributed either to Truman or Ben Gurion. I figure they got it from each other. Um, that a certain kind of phrase, it's like perfume is sweet to smell, but don't swallow it. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll start with Barbara. Do you have a question? I, I do. Uh, one of the comments that, 
It's a fundamental right that I think most of us expect from the Constitution, due process. When you hear a rhetorical speech, and it begins to rise to the level of incitement, which is one of the exceptions to the, to the speech privilege, who should be the judge? I mean, it's often spontaneous. Uh, it's combustible. Uh, who decides? Uh, is there a fair metric? Uh, and uh, you know, what, what is the foreseeability of anybody who's trying to engage in the debate? You know, where do you draw the line at the end? Your literal question, I think, has an easy answer. And my guess is that Fred and I would agree to this. Ultimately, the judge is the judge. That whether or not it's speech unprotected by the First Amendment is a question of law that the judge has to decide. Now, not taking your question literally becomes much more difficult. A police officer on the spot is going to have to make the decision as to whether the speech has crossed the line to incitement and whether to arrest the speakers. There are going to be factual questions that are going to need to be worked out, and the prosecutor's going to have to make a choice in an exercise of prosecutorial discretion whether to prosecute. There may be a jury that's going to have to decide some of the factual issues. But ultimately, the Supreme Court has said that the test for incitement, as I quoted, is there's a substantial likelihood of imminent illegal activity, and the speech has to be directed causing imminent illegal activity. That's for a court to decide. Take two, two sort of extreme sides of it. On the criminal side, you're, you're added by the benefit of this very onerous, properly so, or it beyond reasonable doubt. It is very, very hard to prove that kind of intent to incite beyond a reasonable doubt, and that's a good thing. So the truth is that we're going to get false outcomes in a lot of these cases. There will be people who probably, in some sense, we could say, ought to have been prohibited from what they were doing, but because it can't be proven, uh, will not be, and I think I'd much rather err on that side. So I think the, the criminal standard is designed to be under-inclusive. That's the whole idea of that burden of proof. Moving back into the private university context, all on the other side of the, the, the spectrum, and it's another way of conceptualizing why our situation is different. You know, our mission is not just to provide a, a free, open society where people can interact. Our mission is to educate. So in fact, there, you would not expect to, to under-involve. You don't want to always be involved in a punitive way, but if behavior has reached a point where it's arguably inc inc inciting, um, I think that's what we call an educated moment. Uh, to explain that's not how we, we treat each other. That's not how you persuade people. You know, the, the, the famous joke, you know, shut up, he explained, right? That's, that's not typically the way you persuade people. Um, and that within the confines of our university, we're trying to teach people how to, how to argue differently, how to persuade differently, how to analyze differently. So it, it's not a bad thing for us to run the risk of slightly overreaching because we have a mission of educating people. I'm not sure I want my government to have a, a mission of educating this population. That's got a whole sort of you know thought control feeling to it. Whereas when one of the things you subscribe to in a private university is that you're part of a community and you throw in. This is the metaphor of one big family is is a little hackneyed but not completely off the mark. Okay, we'll, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. We have a microphone down here because uh, I'd like you, if you have a question, to come up there, we'll just take it in the queue. Uh, because if we don't use the microphone, people behind you will not hear the question and we won't be able to record it. Yep. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with the topic of anonymity on the internet. And the topic somewhat lends into more of the policy discussion, Fred, that you were just discussing because it's not framed in the sense of a First Amendment that my question is not framed for should the government impose the registration requirements on speech on the internet. But there's a large debate going on. There was an article this week in the New York Times about Facebook and about Salman Rushdie and about whether or not he should be forced to identify himself by his real name, which is not Salman Rushdie, or and it's being forced by a company. So it's clearly a private right whether or not the, the company should or when is it wise to say that all the blogs and the commentaries and some of the things that you, you know, when we all read the uh, commentary section of the newspaper, there are vile things, there are things that are racist, there are things that are mean, there are things that are improper, but should we require people to give their real name? And should they be required to give their real name on the basis of that they have to take responsibility for what they say? Um, the, 
the argument for it is, of course, well, it will engender responsibility. It will engender possibly public ridicule. Um, the argument against it might be, well, but it would chill speech, that we should allow people to say what they want. Um, or do we want these companies, do we want to encourage these large companies to have this vital information and blend into that? And so the question really is not a First Amendment question, but is a policy. And I think the values that you have expressed, I'd be interested in hearing how you come down on that issue. I think certainly within the within the confines of the boundaries of our university, I think you know, teaching students that there, there's a there's a moral contract here. I'll I'll, I'll defend your right to express uh, views on campus, but you also have to be willing and learn how to stand up and say this is what I'm saying. Um, I I do not respond, for example, even in, in a I mean obviously I can't literally respond to an unsigned letter. Or Respond to, um, but uh, but not even in any kind of a general sense. If somebody doesn't uh, have the courage to tell me who it's coming from, then they don't get a response, and people know that. So I think within the university we can we can certainly do that. Um, you know, as you broaden out, I think what becomes harder here is who is going to keep track of that information, uh, and, and how you're going to make that uh, happen, and you know, how much privacy is being lost. But I will tell you, sort of, not to answer right on, on it, but sort of. Legally, um, and some some people would say that one of the most significant pieces of quote hate crime unquote legislation that was ever passed wasn't a hate crime bill per se. Uh, it was the uh, anti-masking law in Georgia, you know, which was designed to say you can, you can do what you want to do, but you can't have a mask on while you do it because we want to see who it is. And I think in many ways, you you fast forward that to that was in the 50s. You fast forward that up to 1978. You see the real result in Skokie. I mean, Skokie didn't end with a Supreme Court decision. The real result of Skokie is when they had their demonstration. It was a thoroughly pathetic little group who were vastly outnumbered by a group of uh, counter-demonstrators, overwhelmingly uh, blacks and Jews, uh, who organized a counter-demonstrate against the, the neo-Nazis. So in some ways, I think forcing people to say that the price of expression is being willing to say who you are when you express it, is, is something I'm, I'm more comfortable with than, than I might otherwise be in terms of, of what, you know, what requirements we can put on people's behavior as a, as a condition of speech, as it were. I'm certainly comfortable with that within the private laboratory of a private university. Um, I'm a little wary just now of saying I want that to be something that would be obligatory in the, in the public square, um, although the anti-masking statute gives us an interesting uh, approach of thinking about it. The really scary part for me is that just keeping track of all those data and what can they do with it. I think that may be where I want to draw the line with that. I think it would be boring if Fred and I just agree with each other about everything today. But I actually think we do disagree on this. I think I give much more weight to the need to protect anonymous expression, whether it's normatively, as you ask if it was a matter of First Amendment law. The leading Supreme Court case about this, a case called McIntyre versus Ohio Election Commission. Ohio had a law that prohibited distribution of anonymous literature with regard to election campaigns. A woman was convicted under for circulating an anonymous pamphlet with regard to a school board election. And the Supreme Court overturned her conviction. And the Supreme Court said that there is a First Amendment right to speak without disclosing one's identity. There's a First Amendment right to speak anonymously. And the reason is there are instances where who will be chilled if they have to identify themselves. Now, if we focus on certain kinds of speech, we might say, you know, it might be better if that speech gets chilled. But the reality is not only the offensive and vile speech that's chilled, there's other instances where people may want to speak anonymously. Maybe in the context of a university, public or private, students want to complain about things, but they want anonymity because they're afraid of what reprisals might be against them. Whistleblower laws here in the need to protect anonymity. About 11 years ago, I was asked to do a report on the Los Angeles Police Department after a major scandal was exposed. And I interviewed you know, maybe 100 officers, and while I was in the midst of doing this, an officer came to see me at my office at USC. The officer walked in in uniform with a gun and all, I was very afraid that maybe something happened with my children. And he said, Can I close the door and talk to you? And I said, of course. And he told me of the illegal activity that was going on in his station house. 
And he wanted to know who he could report this to anonymously. Because if faith in his identity was revealed, then the next time he was in trouble in the field, no one would protect his back. And it turns out there is no ability of an officer to report something like that anonymously within Los Angeles. There's no whistleblower protection to this day for Los Angeles police officers. You know, I think that's a real cost for them not to be able to report things anonymously. Um, I would read anonymous things, students or faculty, so long as they're civil and decent. If they're vile, I just delete them and pay no attention. But I value anonymous speech. And so I understand the cost of anonymous speech. If there's speech that's defamatory, to be able to liable, and anonymity make it impossible. But I take New York Times versus Sullivan seriously and says we need to have breathing space in the First Amendment. And, uh, somebody in this room undoubtedly knows the technology better than I know, but I don't honestly believe it's a question between being fully anonymous uh, or not. I think it's a question of how difficult is it for the recipient to trace an identifier. Uh, because somebody has to have uh, uh, have established an account with somebody else. And there has to be an identifier. It may be extremely difficult and prohibitive for the recipient to do it, uh, you know, through a whole bunch of links. Uh, I, I don't really want them. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, uh, clearly in the commercial speech area, uh, there are prohibitions on misleading uh, uh, identifiers. Uh, and so at least at some level, uh, there are limits on that. Uh, do you have any other questions? This larger group and this interesting the topic. Yeah, David. Uh, first of all, as one of the sponsors of the event, Marvin, at his age, neglected to mention that I too am a graduate of the University of Houston. I mentioned that. Marvin forgets a lot of things. I could also mention that Marvin beat me up at summer camp in 54. <laughs> 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 I think you were much bigger than I <laughs> um, I've got a comment and then a question. The first as to the emails. Um, a case of mine recently, and, and how a soft voice turned the way wrath. And recently I got an email after a magazine, national magazine published a story about a case of mine that was, had an unpopular result, but we won. And a woman wrote me a long letter and said, you and your client are a couple of sons of bitches. And I wrote her back an explanatory email. I sent her the judge's opinion. And I thought, my, my wife always says that emails sound harsher than they really are meant. And she wrote back and said, I got your email. You're still a son of a bitch. You can't solve all your problems, Dan. No, no, you can't. Um, how, how historically? How has uh, the problem of overreaching by government uh, uh, manifested itself? From my understanding of the law, has it, uh, I'd really like to know, has it been more of a state problem where state uh, uh, restrictions are struck down, or has it been more of a federal problem? Who has drawn their statutes better? Restrictions, restricting speech, free speech. I think it's very over time. So when you think of the laws that have restricted speech, might be thought of as sedition or even incitement. I think it's much more federal laws that have been problematic. Um, I don't want to overstate that. But, so I think here of the Alien and Sedition Act from 1798, that made it a crime to falsely criticize the government, government officials, which is vulnerable. I think Abraham Lincoln's punishing speech during the Civil War that was critical of the Northern War effort. I think of the 1917 and 1918 Espionage Act that essentially made it a crime to criticize the draft and the war effort and led to what I think the results was pretty horrible Supreme Court decisions in cases like Shank and Debs and Forward. I think the Smith Act during the communist era that made it a crime to even, well, what was the key case, Dennis versus the United States was conspiracy to advocate the overthrow of the United States government would be punished. Now, I don't want to overstate it in that area, Think of state criminal civicalism statutes which existed, which made it a crime to advocate the overthrow of the government or industrial organization. Obscenity, the first major obscenity law was a federal obscenity law, the Comstock Act. And yet, on the other hand, more obscenity prosecutions in the 20th century were at state levels than local levels. When you deal with hate speech, that's really been very much at the local level. You have a tort liability. That's true at the state and local level. So I think it's a mixed 
spectrum. I think there is always the impulse to want to censor the speech that we don't like. And we can justify that in the most self-righteous terms. And I think that impulse exists both in Congress and at the state and local level. I think the danger with any kind of consequentialist for First Amendment jurisprudence, we restrict speech based on the likely consequences of it, is that at the time that you're measuring it, almost by definition, when, when you're going to need the protection, you're going to get at least. Right? The people who were worried about uh, communists in the 50s or were worried about um, a draft evasion for the First World War, they, they weren't bad people. They, thought, they, they, they weren't worried about Martians. I mean, they were worried about what they thought were real things. Um, but it doesn't take all that much uh, retrospect to, to, to see how wrong-headed uh, most all of that was. So I, I think that both federal and state, you get people who are pushing back about what they take to be risks and harms and threats. And then if you evaluate it based on how clear and how present the danger, you get a lot of a lot of bad decisions until relatively recent, and many of those have been cut back. Yes, sir. Uh, recently, a young woman wrote an article for the Vanderbilt Hustler uh, in which she criticized a local religiously based fraternity on campus for expelling several of its gay members uh, because they were homosexual. Uh, and that it, she criticized the organization for violating that campus's uh, code of non discrimination. Uh, and it reached, uh, it went across the country with a viral story, uh, and the dean was taking steps to uh, essentially enforce the non discrimination provisions. Uh, and then ended up being reported on the O'Reilly program where uh, the speakers who were commenting on it were saying, well, this is a violation of the religiously based fraternities uh, First Amendment rights to determine uh, its own members. And it seemed to me that's an interesting set of issues and I would just appreciate it hearing your thoughts and commentary on that. First, the Vanderbilt is a private university. Yes. You've got to be exactly what Fred said. There's no way of arguing that Vanderbilt University has violated the First Amendment by choosing to say that the rules for its fraternities are that they have to accept all members or the basic principle. First Amendment doesn't apply to Vanderbilt University. Assume that it was a public university. There is a Supreme Court case right on point from June 2010. It's a case called Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. It involves the University of California at Hastings College of Law, which has a so-called all-comers policy. It says that all student organizations must accept all members. They can't discriminate that on the basis of race, or gender, or religion, or sexual orientation. And the Christian Legal Society chapter of Hastings and long existed that operated that policy, but then they reconstituted themselves and formed a relationship with the National Christian Legal Society. In person its instructions, it said that they would only accept members who sort of believe in allegiance to oath of affirmation in Jesus Christ as the Savior, and also they would only accept, and here I will quote their language, um, they would not accept unrepentant homosexuals. And the dean of Mason's Law School said, consistent with our school's policy, you can't continue to exist as a student-recognized organization. You can't get student activity fees, you can't reserve rooms, you can certainly meet as a group off campus, um, or see each other, but you're not an officially recognized organization. And the Christian Legal Society sued, saying it violated the First Amendment. And the United States Supreme Court, in a 5 4 decision, ruled in favor of Hastings. Um, Justice Ginsburg wrote the opinion for the court. It was joined by Stevens and Kennedy, and um, it was uh, Ginsburg, Stevens, Kennedy, Breyer, and Sotomayor with the majority. And I think the court got it exactly right as a matter of First Amendment law. We have such a policy at my school. My notion is that every student organization that's officially recognized should be open to all students in the school. Some of the money for student organizations often comes from student funds. Well, students shouldn't be having to pay money to support an organization that they can't belong to. If students want to have an organization where they want to be exclusive, they only want to be a Christian organization, they don't want to be a Jewish organization, well, then they can meet on campus. They can get together via email. The reality is if they want to use the room and nobody's there, nobody's going to kick them out. But I think it's completely appropriate for a public university to say, for officially 
recognized student organizations, every student has to be eligible and entitled to be a member. And if Vanderbilt wants to say that's going to be our policy to as a private university, certainly they have the right to do so. It doesn't have to do so. You might be interested to know that this is precisely the reason that Brandeis does not recognize fraternities and sororities. <laughs> uh, so we, we do, in fact, there are off-campus fraternities and sororities. This is an ongoing issue. Uh, early on in a new president's term, we visited by what is a student organization, which is the, uh, the, uh, the Greek Council, uh, which is an open group that reports to it, sort of like Sinn Féin in the, uh, the IRA. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, did I just say that to an open mic? I think I did. Uh, the, um, the, the, they're an officially recognized group, and they asked if we would you know, revisit this, if I would revisit this. It goes back to the founding in 1948, and one of the core principles of Brandeis is no discrimination on the basis of race, creed, color, religion, national origin, uh, sex, sexual orientation. And this is part of the DNA of Brandeis. It would be a hell of a thing to say, you can have student organizations that are allowed to discriminate. Um, and so we, we go through this all the time, and we don't have exclusive groups as fully recognized student, uh, student activities. Just what everyone said, they can be off campus, but they, um, that's why they are, but not officially recognized groups. Would, uh, would you all comment on the First Amendment, political free speech as defined by the Supreme Court, and extremism in our current society? Sure. Um, boy, there's the, there's the three-hour version of that and the two-minute version of that. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do the two-minute version of that, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that the First Amendment by design is going to give us a lot of speech in the public square that many of us would just assume not hear and many of us think goes over the top. And I, I decry the impoverished nature of a lot of what passes for political discussion today that is in fact more in the order of, of either a, a cartoon in the opposition and that drives not to the middle but drives to extremes. And I think the best answer to that is people uh, who agree with me ought to be outraged and their, and their voting and their contributions and the like ought to be driving in that direction and hopefully to that extent that will influence some decisions. But I sure wouldn't want you know, that to be part of the, the discussion of what the government can and can't do to regulate uh, political speech unless it hits a tripwire that goes way past you know, what I would call extremist kind of talk to the level of being direct incitement to the level of being actual targeted threats of uh, uh, individuals. Now, again, taking that within a private context, um, I'll tell you the truth. Within a private context, that's where my view of what it means to be an academic community, an open community, will pretty broadly tolerate a lot of different views uh, there as well, to the point that my guess is what we do pretty much maps onto the First Amendment, you know, other than a certain kind of offensive speech that would be protected, that will say that has no place within the, you know, our community, within the Brandeis community. But I, I think the tripwire there is a dangerous one to, to toe too close to. I would respectfully point out that the question of Paul Close, my college debate partner for three years, and um, a dear friend and one of the great things I'm used to is getting the chance to see him and spend time with him. Um, I think that here you've got to go back to the distinction between what the First Amendment allows versus what speech we think should occur. The First Amendment allows politicians to say almost anything they want in the context of we would never want the government to monitor truth or falsity. We certainly want the government to monitor sensible versus inane, even though a lot of things that are said are inane. I heard one of the candidates on Wednesday say that he will never appoint a federal judge with life tenure. Tell them about Article 3 of the Constitution. <laughs> That's not going to be easy, I guess. I know. But, but you know, you have the right to say inane. They have the right to say things that are critical of each other, obviously, for Bryce, the point of defamation that would be assumed when I think it's very hard for one candidate to sue another for defamation, though it happens occasionally. So the First Amendment provides the right to say almost anything in the election campaign. But that doesn't mean it should be said that there's a real difference between what the First Amendment protects somebody in saying and what we think should occur. This goes to the question about civility. I think that speech should be civil, but I don't think the First Amendment can enforce it. I do believe that there's probably no realm where it's more important to be free speech than with regard to election campaigns. The very core of the First Amendment is speech that relates to the democratic process.
President Lawrence, President Lawrence sort of took the sad wind out of my sails at this point. The point I wanted to make was that a very important the First Amendment protects an awful lot of things. It doesn't protect it from criticism. And in many of these areas, particularly the hate speech, not just that area, general public reaction, boycotts and things like that, we all got we're not so happy with boycotts. Sometimes they seem like bad things, but they're basically, they're protected and they're good things. And if people hear things on the radio that they don't want, that they don't agree with, they can write to sponsors. They can object to it. Uh, there, there are lots of things. I'm thinking particularly about the Sarah Palin ads that had guns pointed at, uh, at candidates, one of whom was uh, Gabrielle Gifford. Uh, clearly, that didn't violate the, Brand the Brandenburg rules, but it certainly was a justifiable thing to complain about. Uh, the only point I make right now is that Mayor Bloomberg may be protected by the Clark case for Ray, but there's an awful lot of criticism going on right now in New York, and there may be a political uh, reaction to what he did, even if it was legal, and that's good. Because the real protector of our freedoms is the people, much more than the courts. I, I, I agree with that, as you probably would, would, uh, would imagine. Let me sort of turn the argument inside out, um, not from a legal point of view, but precisely from the cultural point of view. Um, Robert Hughes wrote a great uh, piece some years ago in New York Review of Books after the, after the aftermath of the Maple Torque exhibit, that you'll recall, was taken down by the Cincinnati Art Museum and it led to a celebrated First Amendment um, litigation about whether they had the right to do that as a public museum, uh, whether you have the right to have the works exhibited. Um, Hughes's take is that, as a non-American, Australian born, um, his take was that we have constitutionalized too many issues in this country, such that the issue becomes, does he or doesn't he have the right to put the, those works of art up in the museum? As a result, he said, there's no place for the aesthetic art. He said, to me, the issue of whether he has the right to exhibit the works is kind of an uninteresting question. I mean, I, I think Irwin and I would say it's an interesting question, but actually relatively easy question. He says the, the important question is, is any of this work any good? And some of it's good, and some of it's garbage, and we have to have a vocabulary for that, not to prohibit it, but that, that critics have to do that. And I think, and, and then the whole public has a role in the cultural discussion. So I think even outside the realm of politics, Hughes's point was that we have in some ways impoverished our own uh, cultural discussion by sort of stopping at the door of the First Amendment question, is there a right to say this, as if that's the only interesting question. Sometimes that's the least interesting question. Yes, you have a right to say it. Now, we have a right to say that it's ridiculous to say you're not going to appoint any, uh, any judges uh, to with life tenure. I guess you don't have to appoint any judges. I guess that's how you can do that. Please let the number of judges just run down. Um, but that that's, a, that that's a crazy thing to say, um, or in the more subtle context of, of Maple Thorpe. That art critics ought to say, fine, well, you have the right to exhibit it. Now, let's have a cultural discussion and an aesthetic discussion and see if we can make some progress. And they do. Open up any newspaper today and there's movie reviews. Of course, we talk all the time about whether art is good or bad or movies are good or bad. We recognize the distinction there. The First Amendment protects the right to make the movie, but that doesn't tell us whether or not the movie is good or bad. And reviewers express their views all the time. I think one of the things that may have been obscured in this discussion is that there's also inevitably going to be hard line drawing questions. There are easy cases. I actually agree with you. I think the, maple, the ability of the Cincinnati Museum to put up the maple dark photographs is an easy First Amendment question. But there are hard questions. I think the place in which hate speech becomes a threat that's no longer protected by the First Amendment, which really then become a hate crime. There's going to be really hard cases there, you know, the cases that are going to need to be argued about. Um, I think the point at which speech becomes harassment is no longer protected by the First Amendment is tremendously difficult. It's easy to say that some speech that's harassment is unprotected by the First Amendment. The employer saying to the employee, sleep with me or you're fired is speech, but clearly that's not protected. And you're certainly right on campus to express things even if they're misogynistic or hateful. But at what point do you cross the line when you've gone from expression to harassment? There's really hard questions there. And what I worry is we don't spend nearly enough time talking about those
hard questions. And so when I think when you were saying, well, the labels are concerned, it's not that we've secured the aesthetic questions. It's a worry that we don't spend enough time talking about the really hard questions. Is it, is it like uh, pornography? Uh, it's hard to define. You know it when you see it. It's a state of speech. You know it when you hear it. Or is there some other measure you can talk about? I, I guess the problem with the you know when you see it is that although it's a charming line and we all know it, it didn't, never struck me as particularly uh, subtle or influential jurisprudence. Um, you know, my, my view is that I think everyone's right that these are hard questions, but that I, I take some comfort in the fact that they are not uniquely hard questions. The question of, uh, of whether somebody acted uh, in, intentionally, recklessly, uh, negligently, or indeed not even so. The criminal law is, is what stuff that we deal with all the time. So I'm, I'm always wary of issues that all of a sudden become part of the civil rights area um, and that we do in other places. I think some of these issues, I don't mean to say that they're easy to decide in an individual case, but I think it's the kind of issue that the law has to confront all the time. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is a good example of it. But I think there are there are easy cases in the, in the hate crimes area in terms of what the intent was, and, and those are ones where the full throttle prosecution uh, we, we go forward with. And then there are, are close cases, and again, as I said, in the criminal context, close cases uh, routinely should be, usually are, resolved towards the defendant. That's the right system. And as you move down through the civil system and on into university sanctions and other software sanctions, um, you can tailor it a little more finely. But it does seem to me that the fact that they're hard questions doesn't mean that they're uniquely hard questions. We're trying to figure out what people are, are doing, what was in their mind when they acted, and that's something we do all the time. Any other questions? Or did you want to well, I just want to say about a uh, question. There's the right to express hateful things on campus, things that are like terribly vile, racist, anti-Semitic. But there's a point at which it becomes so pervasive that it really creates a hostile and today environment. Where is the dance line to be drawn? There's a right to say sexual things in a workplace, even when people are comfortable. But there's a point at which it becomes so pervasive that it is sexual harassment. Where is that line to be drawn? Those are to me really difficult questions. And the ones that I believe often don't get discussed enough. So that's to me where I think the line drawing type issues come up. So let me ask the last question then. Uh, I, I think I've heard this. The Brown case, the one dealing with the video games. Uh, I believe I'm correct in this. Did the court not hold that uh, it, uh, that it was, it declined to hold that violent images uh, would be put into a category that's only protected, uh, even though uh, obscene images are protected. What's, I mean, I, I understand that the, 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 the analysis was, as again, I may be wrong, but that they did not want to extend beyond historical solutions. But is, is there any rational justification for having obscene images unprotected Violent images protected. Um, I would much rather my children see a movie with loving sexuality than a movie with very harsh, aggressive violence. Yes. I think the answer is largely historical. Um, I think that. Sexual speech has been historically unprotected speech or less protected speech. And the courts made clear in two cases in the last two years, it's not willing to go down that path to treat violence as unprotected less protected speech. I also think that the courts informed by how difficult it's been to define obscenity. And I don't think they want to go down the path to try to define, okay, when does violent speech cross the line? Um, what images then are unprotected by the First Amendment? And so I think some of it's historical and some of it is more practical. Yeah, I, I think that's right. If you listen to the, the, to the way in which Justice Scalia is a, a tortured counselor in that case, with different actual cases of uh, what would or would not count as violence, you could have turned that right around and talked about that in the obscenity context. And, uh, but but you know, life is past dependence and we've gotten that far. I want a much better answer. Great, thank you. Uh, I just want to take a moment what you see here is really sort of front office, but there's so much that goes on in the back office that's not apparent this morning to 
And I want to start by thanking Ray and the staff of the Law Center for hosting us. It took a lot of planning and preparation for us to be here for things to go as smoothly as I think they've gone this morning. Secondly, I want to thank the staff, professional staff of the Indian Defamation League for its work in putting this together, especially Jimmy Bernstein, uh, who's really nursed this project along from its, its very beginning and helped all of us uh, make this what I believe to be a very uh, uh, positive and successful event. Uh, and also for all of the lay leadership of ADO who's participated in this. I want to express my gratitude to David and his partners for their support. And I do want to say the same thing for my partners at our firm uh, for being co sponsors. I want to especially thank Fred and Irwin uh, because without both of you being here to make this the event that it is, it simply would not have been possible. And I hope all of you would join me this morning in thanking both of them for coming. <laughs> Thank you.